welcome back to my channel or welcome for the first time if you are new to my channel. <laughs> my name is Kate and I am the creator of The Factory, which is an immersive show about Andy Warhol's factory. So in my show, the audience is invited to come party at the factory where they can help silkscreen paintings, they can sit for their own screen tests, they can participate in filming an underground movie, they can party with the band, all while the story of Andy Warhol's factory and the events that led to his attempted assassination unfold around them. It's a really cool show. I am planning to produce it in 2025 at $3 Bill in Brooklyn, um, but I am an independent creator, I'm an independent producer, and producing immersive theater as an independent artist is insane. I don't know why I'm doing it, except for I have so much passion <laughs> for this story and for immersive theater, so I'm bringing you along on the journey as I move towards producing this show, and as part of that, I am telling stories about the factory and about Andy Warhol and about all the characters that were there. It's super fun, interesting stuff. Before we dive into today's video, which is a very spooky little story, um, I just wanted to let you know that if you are interested in donating to the factory, I would love it. Um, links in the description. The factory is fiscally sponsored by Fractured Atlas, which is a nonprofit arts organization. So all donations are tax deductible. You can go to the link, donate. You can donate one time. You can set up a monthly donation if you so choose. Would be thrilled if you did that. But you know, no pressure. Absolutely no pressure. Also, just want to point out my email will be in the description. So if you think this project is cool, if you're interested in helping out at all, send me an email. Um, like I said, I'm an independent producer and this team is super small, but it is going to grow as we get closer to production. So if this sounds like something that you might want to be involved in, please let me know. Uh, I would love to hear from you. Okay, let's dive in. Um, I today decided that I'm just gonna talk about a little bit about Andy Warhol's early life and an early event that happened at the factory that I think really set the tone for what was to come and also kind of give us an insight into who Andy Warhol is or was as a person. So, just to give you some background about Andy Warhol, Andy Warhol was born August 6th, 1928. He was the youngest child and the fourth child of some immigrants that were from what was then called Ruthenia, um, formerly Czechoslovakia. It is now where Ukraine is today. Um, they lived in Pittsburgh, very working class background. And Andy Warhol was a pretty shy, quiet kid. And he, when he was eight years old, he suffered from a condition which is known as St. Vitus dance, which causes like involuntary muscle spasms. And it also caused him to lose pigmentation in his skin. So that's why Andy Warhol was so like shockingly pale. It was because of this disease that he got when he was a kid. So he spent a lot of his early childhood bedridden because of this St. Vitus dance disease. And while he was a kid in bed, he would read like gossip magazines and movie magazines and he would cut out pictures of stars and paste them all around his room and that was kind of like the first inclination that he had of like this star obsession that would come to kind of define what his art became as an adult and he also spent a lot of time in the catholic church and I don't know if you are familiar with Andy Warhol's work or with Catholicism, but there's some really interesting parallels, especially in the grid-like function that he uses. So a lot of his famous works, most notably the soup cans, but also he did a lot of like prints with different movie stars. It's kind of like this, a lot of times like two by two grid or even bigger, like with the soup cans, I think there's 32 soup cans in the grid. Um, but it's like the same image repeated over and over with like variations in the color scheme. And that's also what like the Catholic church iconography is. When you're sitting down in the pews, looking up at the stained glass windows, it's a very similar kind of grid pattern with these color schemes. So we start to see like where Andy Warhol is getting his visual references from and also like the topical references, the star quality. So he graduates high school. He's like totally a loner. He is gay. I don't think he was out as a teenager in Pittsburgh, but it was pretty obvious that he was gay. And um, he ends up going to Carnegie Tech for art. He actually got put on probation when he was going to Carnegie, Carnegie Tech because 
he was doing really badly. Like his art teachers thought that he was going to go nowhere. He just, uh, he was kind of a loser. Like everybody thought this guy sucks and he's not gonna go anywhere at all. So undeterred, he graduates from college, even though, you know, he was on probation, he gets through it, he graduates and he moves to New York with really no clear plan as to what he's going to do. So he gets to New York and he starts illustrating for magazines. I think his first job was drawing shoes going up a ladder for an article called Success is a Job in New York. And I believe that was for Glamour magazine. So he's doing these illustrations. He also starts working as a window dresser, kind of like doing the designs for like storefront department store windows. And he's making a, a good living and he has roommates and you know he starts to cultivate this like intentionally shabby look he wears like paint splattered jackets he has like ill-fitting jeans rumpled shirts like everything's wrinkled he wears sneakers and he carries his illustrations when he's like cold calling prospective employers he'll bring he'll like go to 17 magazine with a little brown bag like a sack that you carry your lunch in with his like drawings stuffed in and they'd be all crinkled up and sometimes there would be a cockroach in the bag that he would put on in on purpose to like shock people like so he started to become known as raggedy andy in the advertising world because he was such a kook and sometimes he would cold call employers with a technique that his roommate dubbed aggressive shyness where he would like whisper into the telephone and he would whisper very strange things like this is i do not want to try and do an impression of andy warhol but i'm going to he would whisper like i planted some bird seed in the park yesterday i'm trying to grow birds do you have any work for me like a crazy person <laughs> like just absolute creep so he's he's doing this and it's going okay but he really wants to be like a fine artist like a you know, like an artist, not an illustrator. He wants to be famous for his work. And the interesting thing is, at the time, a lot of the artists in New York were known for being like really butch and masculine, even though they also, a lot of them were gay, but they would like act like they weren't or they would present really mask. And Andy Warhol was like, I don't wanna do that, that's not me. He was getting like just completely derided for being like too feminine, too swish, as they said at the time, too fey was another word that was used. Um, and he didn't think that he should have to change. He thought that he's gay, he's gonna be gay, and he's gonna be an artist. And anybody who doesn't like it, he doesn't care about it. Which honestly, for the 1960s, pretty ahead of his time as far as that attitude. So in the early 1960s, Andy Warhol is starting to do pop art at his home studio. And this curator from the Metropolitan Museum of Art named Henry Gelfazer hears about what Andy's doing and he decides to come check it out and like see what's up. When he gets to Andy Warhol's house, he says that it's the most modern scene that he's ever seen. He is stunned by what he sees in Andy Warhol's house. So first when he walks in, there's John Chamberlain's car crash sculpture in the entryway, a large Mr. Peanut, a cigar store Indian, an empire couch, a spangly platform shoe with a five inch heel, a gold Coca-Cola bottle that Andy had saved from a Tiffany's window display, and of course, all of his paintings. Andy has rock and roll music blaring in the background. The tele television is on with no sound, and there are open fashion magazines sprawled everywhere. And Henry says that the room was, quote, the most modern thing he's ever seen. And I want to just stress, because I this might sound like, why am I mentioning what his house looked like? All of this stuff that's going on is basically what he brought into the factory when the factory actually started to get going. So this is kind of like proto-factory, but just in Andy Warhol's living room before he gets to the real factory. So Henry is like, this is crazy, this is great. And he sees the Campbell's soup cans and he is like, these are amazing. And so he ends up calling this gallery owner, Irving Bloom, who lives in California. And Bloom comes to Andy Warhol's house and he sees the 32 silkscreen paintings of the Campbell soup cans for one in every flavor. And he's shocked that no one has wanted to show these in the gallery. And so 
Bloom is like, come to California, we'll show them at my gallery. So Andy comes to California with the Campbell Soup Can paintings, and they show the paintings at Irving's Gallery for the month of July, and the show runs until August 4th. While they're there, a couple of the paintings sell, but nobody really likes the show. They don't really get it. They're like, why, why, why did you make a painting of Campbell's Soup Can? That's dumb. I can see that at the grocery store. Like they really, it's not clicking as to like why this is good art. And so a couple people buy the paintings, but they only sell, I think like less than five. And then Irving Bloom ends up deciding that like he wants to keep all the paintings together as a set. So he ends up actually buying all of the paintings that were sold at the gallery. He buys them back from the people that bought them so they can keep the set together. And the show is kind of considered like a failure. But I want to stress, again, the show runs until August 4th, 1962. Also on August 4th, 1962, Marilyn Monroe dies. As soon as this happens, Andy rushes to get a print. Uh, it was a, a publicity still from the film Niagara, which Marilyn Monroe was in, and he starts working immediately on his Marilyn Monroe paintings. He, Andy Warhol has this real sense of the importance of timing and the glamour of death and how these things kind of like intersect. So he makes Marilyn Monroe paintings. So Andy Warhol around this time decides to get a 16 millimeter Bolex camera and he starts making these like very DIY home movie type movies. They're, they have no dialogue. They're I don't think they even have sound. And so he's making these movies. Around the same time, Andy meets a guy named Billy Linick. And Billy was working as a waiter at this uh, cafe, kind of a gay cafe, known as Serendipity 3. And Billy, like, he's hot. And a lot of clients go there to, like, check out Billy. And so Andy's a fan of Billy. And so he keeps going to Serendipity. He gets to know Billy. And Billy is a really interesting person. I'm going to actually be making another video soon about Billy himself, so you will learn a lot more if you're interested. But Billy basically is on speed. All of his friends are on speed. And Billy has this group of friends that are collectively known as the Mole People. And the Mole People, oh my god, I'm also going to do a video about them because <laughs> really, really fascinating, very strange people. Most of them are homeless. They live in like various states of like underground living. Uh, the reason they're called the mole people is because they like sleep during the day and they only like emerge at night to party. And they like party at these different floating locations, but they're also kind of bonded together by intellectualism and a love of opera and a love of like avant-garde art. So they're like very smart, artistic people, but also just kind of like on drugs all the time and homeless. However, they do have a really unique sense of group cohesion and the mole people who are a collective for years, they take what's called like a family photo every year. So like they have a surprising sense of group identity for what is basically a group of homeless druggies. Love them. I'm not saying that with any ounce of shade, um, but Billy is kind of like the leader for lack of a better word, or like a very important member of the mole people. And Billy has a home. He has a job as at Serendipity 3. He has a home. And he starts like throwing these haircutting parties because Billy is kind of a jack of all trades. His uncle growing up was a hairstylist. And so he learned how to cut hair from his uncle. And so what he ends up doing is like inviting people to his apartment for like speed and a haircut. So like you could do some speed, Billy will cut your hair like a maniac, I assume. Um, and then they were just like, these parties would go on for like days and days at a time. Billy also in kind of like a divinely inspired speed induced like psychosis decides to cover his entire apartment with tin foil, top to bottom, like every little thing is covered in foil. So Andy Warhol gets invited to one of these hair cutting parties and he sees this like shimmery scene of like all this foil everywhere and he sees Billy cutting people's hair and he's like, oh my God, this is beautiful. This should be a movie. And he goes to Billy and he's like, Billy, I just 
got this new studio. It's in Midtown Manhattan. It's this former hat factory. Would you come and like do whatever you've done to your apartment? Will you do it to my new studio? And Billy's like, sure. So Billy moves into this former hat factory, which will become the factory, the famous factory, and gets to work like rewiring it for like electrical stuff and covering every square inch with like tin foil and mirrors and just like anything shiny. And so Billy actually ends up moving into the bathroom at this factory. So Billy's there and because Billy has like now found kind of a permanent place to hang, the mole people also start hanging out at this new space because again, they were homeless and they were having to like move their parties around every night. But now that Billy is like the groundskeeper of this silver factory, they have like a home base. So one of Billy's very good friends is this guy, Freddie Herco, who was a dancer. And once Billy silverizes the whole factory, Andy Warhol is like, I want to do a movie about haircuts, inspired by the haircutting parties that Billy used to have at his apartment. So he films this movie called Haircut, and it features Freddie Herco, the dancer. And Andy goes on to film a lot of movies, but he thinks that Freddie is really special. Andy Warhol liked what he called the leftovers of show business, which is kind of the people that like, they go to the auditions and they try really hard and they never get cast. That's who Andy liked. He kind of liked that quality. He thought it was really interesting. And so Freddie was kind of one of those people, a leftover of show business. And like everyone else, Freddie's doing a lot of speed. But Freddie's a dancer and he's a little bit more in tune with his body than the average person. And he starts to notice the effects that speed is having on him kind of before anybody else noticed any bad effects. Again, this was the 60s. They did not know so much about the negative effects of drugs that we know now. So Freddie starts to get like pretty jittery and just like kind of weird. And so nobody really notices at first, but as time goes on, he kind of starts to withdraw from society more and more. And he's living with this girl in um, like Greenwich Village. And at first he like decides to like stop leaving the apartment. And then he stops leaving his room. And then he gets in his closet and he refuses to get out of his closet. So he's kind of like pulling further and further and further away, withdrawing from life. And eventually his roommate gets kind of freaked out and she's like, you gotta go. Like, you're scaring me? Ow. So, Freddie gets kicked out of his apartment. So one day, this lighting designer named John Dodd is walking around Greenwich Village and he sees Freddie Herco just on the street, dancing like a maniac. Like, unkempt, looked like he hadn't eaten in days. He's just dancing, dancing wildly. And so John Dodd invites Freddie to his apartment on Cornelia Street in Greenwich Village to like take a bath and calm down and have some food. And so they go up to his, I believe, like fifth or sixth floor apartment and Freddie takes a bath. And while Freddie is taking a bath, um, John puts on Mozart's coronation mass on the record player. And I'll remind you that Freddie is one of the mole people. I believe John was also like kind of connected to the mole people. They loved opera. That was like, their favorite thing. They just were obsessed with opera. And so when John puts on Coronation Mass, Freddie like perks up in the bathtub. He loves Coronation Mass. And so he gets out of the tub and he starts dancing wildly around the living room and he's like spinning around. And there's this painting of like angels on John's ceiling. And, and Freddie's like looking at this painting, this kind of fresca of these like angels and he's dancing and he's like totally naked. And as the song, I believe it was Sanctus on the record, kind of is reaching its climax, Freddie starts spinning and spinning around the apartment and he starts leaping and leaping and leaping until he gets close to an open window. And Freddie Herco, at the climax of Mozart's Coronation Mass, leaps completely naked out of John's sixth floor apartment window and kills himself. And this shocked the mole people community. It shocked 
the like very early factory community. And again, this was kind of before the factory took off. This was right when Billy was still kind of putting the foil on the walls and before Andy's art had really popped off. This is just kind of an underground group of people. Freddie kills himself and everyone is just completely shocked, except for Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol, when he hears what Freddie Herco has done, tells people, oh, I wish if Freddie knew he was gonna do this, I wish he would have told me and I wish he would have let me film it. And that's Andy's response. And everyone is kind of shocked also by this response from Andy. People think it's like very cold and callous. Like what? You want, if you knew, if Freddie knew he was gonna kill himself, you wish he would have let you film it? Like, are you crazy? But I think that's a very interesting window into Andy Warhol's psyche and how he saw fame and how he saw media and how he saw death and how he saw the glamour of death. Andy's work is kind of all about stardom in a lot of ways. And there's this great quote by another character named Andine, who was another one of the mole people who I will be doing a video about. But he says, I'm gonna paraphrase it, that in Andy Warhol's interpretation of stardom, the rise is just as important as the fall. So basically you can't be a star without having the rise, but you also can't be a star without the fall. They, it's a complete circle. And you, if you're gonna be a star, you go through all of it. And so that's kind of like where Andy Warhol is coming from as far as like his view on glamor and fame and death. And it's kind of scary. And I am not saying I agree with it, but I find it really interesting. So that is the tragic story of Freddie Herco. After that incident is when the factory really started to get going. And that story kind of got brushed to the side and people kind of tried to gloss over the whole Freddie Herco situation because everyone started to have a really good time. And Andy Starr started to climb not long after this. So I'm gonna be making more videos about each of the characters in my show and some of the other stories that I think are really interesting about the factory. So stay tuned for that. Next week, we are going to talk about Valerie Solanas, the woman herself. Um, and that's gonna be another interesting video. So if you like this content, please hit subscribe. It really helps me out. Like the video, leave a comment, um, donate to the show. And if you wanna be involved, send me an email. And that's it for today. I think I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a good one and I will see you in the next one. Bye.